Section 3 of A Treatise of the Fear of God by John Bunyan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of several sorts of fear of God in the heart of the children of men. Having thus spoken of the object and rule of our fear, I should come now to speak of fear as it is a grace of the Spirit of God in the hearts of his people. But before I do that, I shall show you that there are diverse sorts of fear besides. For man, being a reasonable creature, and having even by nature a certain knowledge of God, hath also naturally something of the kind of fear of God at all times, which, although it be not that which is intended in the text, yet ought to be spoken to, that that which is not right may be distinguished from that that is. There is, I say, several sorts or kinds of fear in the hearts of the sons of men, I mean besides that fear of God that is intended in the text, and that accompanieth eternal life. I shall here make mention of three of them. First, there is a fear of God that flows even from the light of nature. Second, there is a fear of God that flows from some of his dispensations to men, which yet is neither universal nor saving. Third, there is a fear of God in the heart of some men that is good and godly, but doth not for ever abide so. To speak a little to all these, before I come to speak of fear, as it is a grace of God in the hearts of his children. And first, to the first, to wit, that there is a fear of God that flows even from the light of nature. A people may be said to do things in a fear of God, when they act one towards another in things reasonable and honest betwixt man and man, not doing that to others they would not have done to themselves. This is that fear of God which Abraham thought the Philistines had destroyed in themselves, when he said of his wife to Abimelech, She is my sister. For when Abimelech asked Abraham why he said of his wife, She is my sister, he replied, saying, I thought, surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. Genesis 20, verse 11. I thought verily that in this place men had stifled and choked that light of nature that is in them, at least so far forth as not to suffer it to put them in fear, when their lusts were powerful in them to accomplish their ends on the object that was present before them. But this I will pass by, and come to the second thing, namely, Second, to show that there is a fear of God that flows from some of his dispensations to men, which yet is neither universal nor saving. This fear, when opposed to that which is saving, may be called an ungodly fear of God. I shall describe it by these several particulars that follow. First, there is a fear of God that causeth a continual grudging, discontent, and heart-risings against God under the hand of God, and that is, when the dread of God in his coming upon men to deal with them for their sins is apprehended by them and yet by this dispensation they have no change of heart to submit to god thereunder the sinners under this dispensation cannot shake god out of their mind nor yet graciously tremble before him but through the unsanctified frame that they now are in they are afraid with ungodly fear and so in their minds let fly against him this fear oftentimes took hold of the children of israel when they were in the wilderness in their journey to the promised land still they feared that god in this place would destroy them but not with that fear that made them willing to submit, for their sins, to the judgment which they fear, but with that fear that made them let fly against God. This fear showed itself in them even at the beginning of their voyage, and was rebuked by Moses at the Red Sea, but it was not there, nor yet at any other place so subdued, but that it would rise again in them at times to the dishonour of God, and the anew making of them guilty of sin before him, Exodus 14, verses 11 to 13, Numbers 14, verses 1 to 9. This fear is that which God said he would send before them in the day of Joshua, even a fear that should possess the inhabitants of the land, to it a fear that should arise for that faintness of heart, that they should be swallowed up of it, at their apprehending of Joshua in his approaches towards them to destroy them. I will send my fear before thee, and I will destroy all the people to whom thou shalt come and I will make all thine enemies turn their backs unto thee. Exodus 23, verse 27. This day, says God, will I begin to put the dread of thee and the fear of thee upon the nations that are under the whole heaven, who shall hear report of thee, and shall tremble, and be in anguish because of thee. Deuteronomy 2, verse 25, chapter 11, verse 25. Now this fear is also, as you see here, called anguish, and in another place an hornet, for it and the soul that falls upon it do greet each other as boys and bees do. The hornet puts men in fear, not so as to bring the heart into a sweet compliance with his terror, but so as to stir up the spirit into acts of opposition and resistance, yet withal they flee before it. I will send hornets before thee, which shall drive out the hivite, etc. 
Exodus 23, verse 28. Now this fear, whether it be ruled by misapprehending of the judgments of God, as in the Israelites, or otherwise as in the Canaanites, yet ungodliness is the effect thereof, and therefore I call it an ungodly fear of God, for it stirreth up murmurings, discontents, and heart-risings against God, while he with his dispensations is dealing with them. Second, there is a fear of God that driveth a man away from God. I speak not now of the atheist, nor of the pleasurable sinner, nor yet of these and that fear that I spoke of just now. I speak now of such who through a sense of sin and of God's justice fly from him of a slavish ungodly fear. This ungodly fear was that which possessed Adam's heart in the day that he did eat of the tree concerning which the Lord had said unto him, In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. For then he was possessed with such a fear of God as made him to seek to hide himself from his presence. I heard, said he, thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Genesis 3 verse 10. Mind it, he had a fear of God, but it was not godly. It was not that he made him afterwards submit himself unto him, for that would have kept him from not departing from him, or else have brought him to him again, with bound, broken, and contrite spirit. But this fear, as the rest of his sin, managed his departing from his God, and pursued him to provoke him still so to do. By it he kept himself from God, by it his whole man was carried away from him. I call it ungodly fear, because it begat in him ungodly apprehensions of his Maker, because it confined Adam's conscience to the sense of justice only, and consequently to despair. The same fear also possessed the children of Israel when they heard the law delivered to them on Mount Sinai, as is evident, for it made them that they could neither abide his presence nor hear his word. It drove them back from the mountain, it made them, saith the apostle to the Hebrews, that they could not endure that which was commanded. Hebrews 12, verse 20. Wherefore this fear Moses rebukes, and forbids their giving way thereto. Fear not, said he, but had that fear been godly, he would have encouraged it, and not forbid and rebuke it as he did. Fear not, said he, for God is come to prove you. They thought otherwise, God, saith he, is come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces. Therefore that fear, that already had taken possession of them, was not the fear of God, but a fear that was of Satan, of their own misjudging hearts, and so a fear that was ungodly. Exodus 20, verses 18 to 20. Mark you, here is a fear and a fear, a fear forbidden and a fear commended, a fear forbidden because it engendered their hearts to bondage and to ungodly thoughts of God and of his word. It made them that they could not desire to hear God speak to them any more. Verses 19 to 21. Many also at this day are possessed with this ungodly fear, and you may know them by this, they cannot abide conviction for sin, and if at any time the word of the law by the preaching of the word comes near them, they will not abide that preacher, nor such kind of sermons any more. They are, as they deem, best at ease when furtherest off of God, and of the power of his word. The word preached brings God nearer to them than they desire he should come, because whenever God comes near, their sins by him are manifest, and so is the judgment too that to them is due. Now these, not having faith in the mercy of God through Christ, nor that grace that tendeth to bring them to him, they cannot but think of God amiss, and their so thinking of him makes them say unto him, Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. Job 21 verse 14. Wherefore their wrong thoughts of God beget in them this ungodly fear, and again this ungodly fear doth maintain in them the continuance of these wrong and unworthy thoughts of God, and therefore, through that devilish service wherewith they strengthen one another, the sinner, without a miracle of grace prevents him, is drowned in destruction and perdition. It was this ungodly fear of God that carried Cain from the presence of God into the land of Nod, and that put him there upon any carnal worldly business, if perhaps he might by so doing stifle convictions of the majesty and justice of God against sin, and so live the rest of his vain life in the more sinful security and fleshly ease. This ungodly fear is that also which Samuel perceived at the people's apprehension of their sin, to begin to get hold of their hearts, wherefore he, as Moses before him, quickly forbids their entertaining of it. Fear not, said he, ye have done all this wickedness, yet turn not aside from following the Lord, for to turn them aside from following of them was the natural tendency of this fear. But fear not, said he, that is, with that fear that tendeth to turn you aside. Now I say the matter that this fear worketh upon, as in Adam and the Israelites mentioned before, was their sin. 
You have sinned, says he, that is true, yet turn not aside, yet fear not without fear that would make you so do, 1 Samuel 12, verse 20. Note, by the way, sinner, that when the greatness of thy sins, being apprehended by thee, shall work in thee that fear of God, as shall incline thy heart to fly from him, thou art possessed with a fear of God that is ungodly, yea, so ungodly, that not any of thy sins for heinousness may be compared therewith, as might be made manifest in many particulars. But Samuel, having rebuked this fear, presently sets before the people another, to wit, the true fear of God. Fear the Lord, says he, serve him with all your heart, verse 24 and he giveth them this encouragement so to do, for the Lord will not forsake his people. This ungodly fear is that which you read of in Isaiah 2, and in many other places, and God's people should shun it, as they would shun the devil, because its natural tendency is to forward the destruction of the soul in which it has taken possession. Third, there is a fear of God which, although it hath not in it that power as to make men flee from God's presence, yet it is ungodly, because even while they are in the outward way of God's ordinances, their hearts are by it quite discouraged from attempting to exercise themselves in the power of religion. Of this sort are they which dare not cast off the hearing, reading, and discourse of the word as others, no, nor the assembly of God's children for the exercise of other religious duties, for their conscience is convinced this is the way and worship of God. But yet their heart, as I said, by this ungodly fear is kept from a powerful gracious falling in with God. This fear takes away their heart from all holy and godly prayer in private, and from all holy and godly zeal for his name in public. And there may be professors whose hearts are possessed with this ungodly fear of God, and they are intended by the slothful one. He was a servant, a servant among the servants of God, and had gifts and abilities given him therewith to serve Christ, as well as his fellows, yea, and was commanded to, as well as the rest, to occupy till his master came. But what does he? Why, he takes his talent, the gift that he was to lay out for his master's profit, and puts it in a napkin, digs a hole in the earth, and hides his lord's money, and lies in a lazy manner at two elbow all his days, not out of, but in, his lord's vineyard, for he came among the servants also at last, by which it is manifest that he had not cast off his profession, but was slothful and negligent while he was in it. But what was it that made him thus slothful? What was it that took away his heart while he was in the way, and that discouraged him from falling in with the power and holy practice of religion, according to the talent he received? Why, it was this, he gave way to an ungodly fear of God, and that took away his heart from the power of religious duties. Lord, said he, behold, here is thy pound which I have kept, laid up in a napkin, for I feared thee. Why, man, doth the fear of God make a man idle and slothful? No, no that is, if it be right and godly. This fear was therefore evil fear. It was that ungodly fear of God, which I have here been speaking of. For I feared thee, or as Matthew hath it, for I was afraid. Afraid of what? Of Christ. That he was an hard man, reaping where he sowed not, and gathering where he had not strawed. This, his fear, being ungodly, made him apprehend of Christ contrary to the goodness of his nature, and so took away his heart from all endeavours to be doing of that which was pleasing in his sight, Luke 19, verse 20, Matthew 25, verses 24 and 25. And thus do all those that retain the name and show of religion, but are neglectors as to the power and godly practice of it. These will live like dogs and swine in the house, they pray not, they watch not their hearts, they pull not their hands out of their bosoms to work, they do not strive against their lusts, nor will they ever resist unto blood, striving against sin, they cannot take up their cross or improve what they have to God's glory. Let all men, therefore, take heed of this ungodly fear and shun it as they shun the devil, for it will make them afraid where no fear is. It will tell them that there is a lion in the street, the unlikeliest place in the world for such a beast to be in. It will put a visard upon the face of God, most dreadful and fearful to behold, and then quite discourage the soul as to his service. So it served thee slothful servant, and so it will serve thee, poor sinner, if thou entertainest it, and givest way thereto. But, fourth, this ungodly fear of God shows itself also in this, it will not suffer the soul that is governed thereby to trust only to Christ for justification of life, but will bend the powers of the soul to trust partly to the works of the law. Many of the Jews were, in the time of Christ and his apostles, possessed with this ungodly fear of God, for they were not as the former, to wit, as the slothful servant, to receive a talent and hide it in the earth in a napkin, but they were an industrious people, 
They followed after the law of righteousness, they had a zeal of God, and of the religion of their fathers, but how then did they come to miscarry? Why, their fear of God was ungodly. It would not suffer them wholly to trust to the righteousness of faith, which is the imputed righteousness of Christ. They followed after the law of righteousness, but attained not to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but, as it were, by the works of the law, but what was it that made them join their works of the law with Christ but their unbelief, whose foundation was ignorance and fear? They were afraid to venture all in one bottom. They thought two strings to one bow would be best. And thus, betwixt two stools, they came to the ground. And hence, to fear and to doubt, are put together as being the cause one of another. Yea, they are put oft times the one for the other. Thus ungodly fear for unbelief. Be not afraid, only believe. And therefore he that is overruled and carried away with this fear is coupled with the unbeliever that is thrust out from the holy city among the dogs. But the fearful and unbelievers and murderers are without. Revelation 21 verse 8, the fearful and unbelieving, you see, are put together, for indeed fear, that is, this ungodly fear, is the ground of unbelief, or, if you will, unbelief is the ground of fear, this fear. But I stand not upon nice distinctions. This ungodly fear hath a great hand in keeping of the soul from trusting only to Christ's righteousness for justification of life. Fifth, this ungodly fear of God is that which will put men upon adding to the revealed will of God their own inventions and their own performances of them as a means to pacify the anger of God. For the truth is, where this ungodly fear reigneth, there is no end of law and duty. When those that you read of in the book of Kings were destroyed by the lions because they had set up idolatry in the land of Israel, they sent for a priest from Babylon that might teach them the manner of the God of the land. But, behold, when they knew it, being taught it by the priest, yet their fear would not suffer them to be content with that worship only. They feared the Lord, saith the text, and served their own gods. And again, so these nations feared the Lord, and served their graven images. 2 Kings 17. It was this fear also that put the Pharisees upon inventing so many traditions, as of the washing of cups, of beds, and tables, and basins, with abundance of such other like gear, none knows the many dangers that an ungodly fear of God will drive a man into, Mark 7. How has it racked and tortured the papists for hundreds of years together? For what else is the cause of this ungodly fear, at least in the most simple and harmless of them, of their penances, as creeping to the cross, going barefoot on pilgrimage, whipping themselves, wearing of sackcloth, saying so many paternosters, so many Ave Marias, making so many confessions to the priest, giving so much money for pardons, and abundance of other the like, but this ungodly fear of God. For could they be brought to believe this doctrine, that Christ was delivered for our offences, and raised again for our justification, and to apply it by faith with godly boldness to their own souls, this fear would vanish, and so consequently all those things with which they so needlessly and unprofitably afflicted themselves, offend God and grieve his people, Therefore, gentle reader, although my text doth bid that indeed thou shouldst fear God, yet it includeth not, nor accepteth of any fear, no, not of any or every fear of God. For there is, as you see, a fear of God that is ungodly, and that is to be shunned as their sin. Wherefore thy wisdom and thy care should be to see and prove thy fear to be godly, which shall be the next thing that I shall take in hand. Third. The third thing that I am to speak to is that there is a fear of God in the heart of some men that is good and godly, but yet doth not for ever abide so. Or, you may take it thus, there is a fear of God that is godly but for a time. In my speaking to and opening of this to you, I shall observe this method. First, I shall show you what this fear is. Second, I shall show you by whom or what this fear is wrought in the heart. Third, I shall show you what this fear doth in the soul. And fourth, I shall show you when this fear is to have an end. First, for the first, this fear is an effect of sound awakenings by the word of wrath, which begetteth in the soul a sense of its right to eternal damnation. For this fear is not in every sinner. He that is blinded by the devil, and that is not able to see that his state is damnable, he hath not this fear in his heart. But he that is under the powerful workings of the word of wrath, as God's elect are at first conversion, he hath this godly fear in his heart, that is, he fears that that damnation will come upon him, which by the justice of God is due unto him, because he hath broken his holy law. This is the fear that made the three thousand cry out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And that made the jailer cry out, and that with great trembling of soul, 
Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Acts 2 verse 16. The method of God is to kill and make alive, to smite and then heal. When the commandment came to Paul, sin revived, and he died. And that law which was ordained to life he found to be unto death. That is, it passed a sentence of death upon him for his sins, and slew his conscience with that sentence. Therefore, from that time that he heard that word, Why persecutest thou me? which is all one, as if he had said, Why dost thou commit murder? He lay under the sentence of condemnation by the law, and under this fear of that sentence in his conscience. He lay, I say, under it, until that Ananias came to him to comfort him, and to preach unto him the forgiveness of sin, Acts 9. The fear, therefore, that now I call godly, it is that fear which is properly called the fear of eternal damnation for sin, and this fear at first awakening is good and godly, because it ariseth in the soul from a true sense of its very state. Its state by nature is damnable, because it is sinful, and because he is not one that as yet believeth in Christ for remission of sins. He that believeth not shall be damned. He that believeth not is condemned already, and the wrath of God abideth on him. Mark 16, verse 16, John 3, verses 18 and 36. The which, when the sinner at first begins to see, he justly fears it. I say, he fears it justly, and therefore godly, because by this fear he subscribes to the sentence that is gone out against him for sin. Second, by whom or by what is this fear wrought in the heart? To this I shall answer in brief. It is wrought in the heart by the Spirit of God, working there at first as a spirit of bondage, on purpose to put us in fear. This Paul insinuateth, saying, Ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Romans 8 verse 15. He doth not say, Ye have not received the spirit of bondage, for that they had received, and that to put them in fear, which was at their first conversion, as by the instances made manifest of before is manifest. All that he says is that they had not received it again, that is, after the spirit, as a spirit of adoption is come, for then, as a spirit of bondage, it cometh no more. It is then the Spirit of God, even the Holy Ghost, that convinceth us of sin, and so of our damnable state because of sin, John 16, verses 8 and 9. For it cannot be that the Spirit of God should convince us of sin, but it must also show us our state to be damnable because of it, especially if it so convinceth us before we believe, and that is the intent of our Lord in that place, of sin, and so of their damnable state by sin, because they believe not on me. Therefore the Spirit of God, when he worketh in the heart as a spirit of bondage, he doth it by working in us by the law. For by the law is the knowledge of sin, Romans 3, verse 20. And he, in this his working, is properly called a spirit of bondage. 1. Because by the law he shows us that indeed we are in bondage to the law, the devil, and death and damnation. For this is our proper state by nature, though we see it not until the Spirit of God shall come to reveal this our state of bondage unto our own senses by revealing to us our sins by the law. 2. He is called, in this his working, the spirit of bondage, because he here also holds us, to wit, in this sight and sense of our bondage state, so long as is meet we should be so held, which to some of the saints is a longer, and to some a shorter time. Paul was held in it three days and three nights, but the jailer and the three thousand, so far as can be gathered, not above an hour. But some in these later times are so held for days and months, if not years. But, I say, let the time be longer or shorter, it is the Spirit of God that holdeth him under this yoke, and it is good that a man should be in his time held under it, as is that saying of the lamentation, it is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth, Lamentations 3 verse 27, that is, at his first awakening, so long as it seems good to this Holy Spirit to work in this manner by the law. Now, as I said, the sinner is at first, by the Spirit of God held in this bondage, that is, hath such a discovery of his sin and of his damnation for sin made to him, and also is held so fast under the sense thereof, that it is not in the power of any man, nor yet of the very angels in heaven, to release him or set him free, until the Holy Spirit changeth his ministration, and comes in the sweet and peaceable tidings of salvation by Christ in the gospel to his poor, dejected, and afflicted conscience. Third, I now come to show you what this fear doth in the soul, now, although this godly fear is not to last always with us, as I shall further show you anon, yet it greatly differs from that which is wholly ungodly of itself, both because of the author and also of the effects of it. Of the author I have told you before, I now shall tell you what it doth. 1. This fear makes a man judge himself for sin, and to fall down before God with a broken mind under this judgment. 
the which is pleasing to God, because the sinner, by so doing, justifies God in his saying, and clears him in his judgment. Psalm 51, verses 1 to 4. 2. As this fear makes a man judge himself and cast himself down at God's foot, so it makes him condole and bewail his misery before him, which is also well pleasing in his sight. I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself, saying, Thou hast chastised me, and I was chastised as a bullock, unaccustomed to the yoke, etc. Jeremiah 31, verses 18 and 19. 3. This fear makes a man lie at God's foot and puts his mouth in the dust, if so be there may be hope. This also is well pleasing to God, because now is the sinner as nothing, and in his own eyes less than nothing, as to any good or desert. He sitteth alone and keepeth silence, because he hath now this yoke upon him. He putteth his mouth in the dust, if so be there may be hope. Lamentations 3, verses 28 and 29. 4. This fear puts a man upon crying to God for mercy, and that in most humble manner, now he sensibly cries, now he dejectedly cries, now he feels and cries, now he smarts and cries out, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Luke 18, verse 13. 5. This fear makes a man that he cannot accept of that for support and succor, which others that are destitute thereof will take up and be contented with. This man must be washed by God himself and cleansed from his sin by God himself. Psalm 51. 6. Therefore this fear goes not away until the Spirit of God doth change his ministration, as to this particular, in leaving off to work now by the law as afore, and coming to the soul with the sweet word of promise of life and salvation by Jesus Christ. Thus far this fear is godly, that is, until Christ, by the Spirit in the Gospel, is revealed and made over unto us, and no longer. Thus far this fear is godly, and the reason why it is godly is because the groundwork of it is good. I told you before what this fear is, namely, it is the fear of damnation. Now, the ground for this fear is good, as is manifest by these particulars. One, the soul feareth damnation, and that rightly, because it is in its sins. Two, the soul feareth damnation rightly, because it hath not faith in Christ, but is at present under the law. Three, the soul feareth damnation rightly now, because by sin, the law, and for want of faith, the wrath of God abideth on it. But now, although thus far this fear of God is good and godly, yet after Christ by the Spirit in the word of the gospel is revealed to us, and we made to accept of him as so revealed and offered to us by a true and living faith, this fear, to wit, of damnation, is no longer good but ungodly, nor doth the Spirit of God ever work it in us again. Now we do not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, that is to say, to fear damnation, but we have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Father, Father, but I would not be mistaken when I say that this fear is no longer godly. I do not mean with reference to the essence and habit of it, for I believe it is the same in the seed which shall afterwards grow up to a higher degree, and into a more sweet and gospel current and manner of working, but I mean reference to this act of fearing damnation. I say, it shall never by the Spirit be managed to that work, it shall never bring forth that fruit more. And my reasons are... End of section 3